Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm Naomi Kent from the Parliamentary Outreach team. I think most of you have had an email or an email conversation with me at some point. Um, welcome to the second open lecture at Parliament. Uh, we had our first open lecture in March. Some of you were there, um, and it was delivered by Andrew Kennan, who's uh, the Clerk of Committees in the House of Commons. And uh, we're delighted to welcome David Beamish, Clerk of the Parliament, to deliver our next open lecture for us. This series is part of a new project from Parliament's Outreach Service, which is about giving universities new resources and services to, to support them to uh, learn and teach about how Parliament works. Uh, Parliament's Outreach Service is, is a part of Parliament. We, we come out and we do free training workshops and talks about how Parliament works and we run other projects like this as well to, to open up Parliament to the public. So a uh, couple of very brief things. Uh, we are filming the lecture today uh, which you should have been told on your way in and hopefully if you prefer not to be filmed you've sat at the back or at the sides. Uh, the film will be available on the Parliament website quite soon after today and I will send everyone out a link to that so you can pass it on to your friends who are not lucky enough to come um, or watch it again because I'm sure you will want to, to recapture everything. Um, we will uh, David will deliver his lecture and then we're going to have a, a quite extended question and answer session. So don't be shy during that. We'll have a few roving microphones um, and we should have a chance to, to give you all the information that you want about the House of Lords. So, and we will stop filming at that point. You can draw your own inferences for why we're going to do that. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to uh, David Beamish and uh, thank you very much for coming. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see so many of you here, and thank you very much for coming. Um, as my uh, first slide shows, uh, my name is David Beamish, and my rather uninformative job title is Clerk of the Parliament. Uh, that means I'm the uh, head of the administration, chief executive, if you like, of the House of Lords. Um, I'm afraid I started there in 1974, so I've been working here rather a long time. Um, hence the title of this talk, an, an insider's guide. Obviously, I've seen quite a lot change over those years, and uh, I hope during question time you'll be able to uh, elicit a, uh, information about a, any aspects you're particularly interested in. Um, I'm going to try and avoid bombarding you with facts, but um, we do have some handouts at the back. The House of Lords Information Office produced some very useful materials, um, including um, uh, hot off the press, the latest uh, figures for membership of the House, but a lot of other useful material. Um, there's also, I've noticed, um, pens from the Parliamentary Outreach Service, which do have a, a particular use. They've got on them the, the website address, www.parliament.uk, which I commend to you as a useful source of all sorts of information. I'm afraid because there's so much, it can be a little bit hard to find your way around. Um, but uh, th th those two things mean that I don't feel I've got to sort of uh, give you a, a chronicle of lots of facts and figures. But do ask me for them if you want to when we get on to the question session. Um, just to set the scene, we're in Portcullis House. The House of Lords uh, occupies the far end of the Palace of Westminster. Here's Portcullis House on the right. Um, we're in the area at the end. Um, we acquired uh, 10 years or so ago one uh, serious outbuilding, which uh, uh, sorry, there's, there's a view from the other side, my, my office being here and the chamber behind there. But uh, one serious outbuilding, Millbank House, but ra rather less than the House of Commons who've got this splendid building that we're in now, Portcullis House. Uh, Millbank House is used for offices for uh, uh, well over 150 members and over 200 of my 500 staff. So um, it's uh, uh, as much a place of work for us as uh, the, the main palace of Westminster. Um, turning to the, the chamber, the centre of the action, so to speak, uh, there's me in the middle in my wig and gown. Um, if you uh, watch Question Time ever, you'll find it's my job to call on the questions, and there I am at the far end uh, 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 of the row. So that's setting the scene. Now, in recent weeks, there's been quite a lot of publicity about the government's plans for reforming the House of Lords. So I thought with that backdrop to this talk, um, I ought to um, talk about that a fair bit. Um, uh, and and uh, 
set what's going on now and what the House does in the context of what might happen in the future. So my next couple of slides are just to introduce where we've got to. Now I must apologise for the fact that the writing is spilling over. I've used our nice Gil Sands font that we use in the House of Lords and it's not loaded on this computer so it's substituted a slightly bigger font which um, is spilling off the end but I hope you can read it none the same. Now I suppose the key message from this slide is that talk of House of Lords reform has been going on for a long time and, and some things indeed have, have, have happened. Um, until 1876 all the members were hereditary apart from the uh, bishops. Um, in 1911 uh, they um, curtailed the powers of the House for the first time until then the House could block any act of Parliament. Um, in 1949 they reduced the powers further by reducing the power of delay from in crude terms two years to one year. Um, 1958 they introduced life peerages more generally so it's, there's been a bit of a continuous process um, with perhaps the biggest uh, single change being in 1999 when uh, all but 100 or so of the then 750 members who had inherited their titles, nearly all male I'm afraid, um, were removed from the House and it went down from nearly 1,300 members to more like 700. It's now back uh, near the 800 mark. Um, and there have been a whole lot of inquiries in recent years. And I suppose the story of reform starts in the mid-90s when the Labour Party grasped the issue of House of Lords reform and came to power in 1997, I'll say a little bit more about this later, with a commitment to remove the hereditary peers, as happened in 1999. But that was the first stage of uh, a two-stage reform to replace the House by an uh, a democratically or largely democratically elected chamber, something that had been envisaged as long ago as the preamble to the 1911 Parliament Act. So alongside the House of Lords bill in 1999, which removed uh, the hereditary members, though as a result of a compromise amendment, uh, 92 of them stayed on and a few more were given life peerages, hence my figure of around 100 or so. But alongside that, they appointed a royal commission. Um, which started in March 1999 and reported in January 2000. And as they produced, as you can see, quite a, a fat volume, uh, which I think has tended to be largely forgotten. Where they ended up with was a recommendation for a largely appointed House with a, uh, a, a smallish proportion of elected members. And I can't give you a figure because there were three different models. Um, uh, I think the one that most members favoured had 87 um, elected members elected regionally. Um, and that didn't really find much favour, so things have moved on since then. But what's quite interesting about this report is they did a pretty thorough job and started from first principles. Um, and uh, they looked at what you want your second chamber to do, so that then what powers you need to give it, and finally how you should constitute it to deliver that. And the interesting thing for me is that now the argument is really purely about the third of those things. I think the key message there was that um, the first two, we were somewhere near right. Uh, people like the functions that the House of Lords does, which you could broadly classify as a combination of scrutiny of legislation, both to tidy it up and to make the Commons think again on, on some big issues. Um, scrutiny of the government through questions and debates and detailed study of subjects uh, uh, through uh, com committees and, and debates on, on the floor of the House. Those are sort of the, the, the main things that happen. And, um, this, this report had one or two suggestions, for example, that a reformed House ought to have a constitution committee to look at constitutional issues. Well, you didn't need reform to deliver that. And uh, within a year or two of the report coming out, we'd set one up and it's now very well established. So that was their, their approach. Um, I'll come back to powers later because there's a bit of an issue there, but um, as you'll be aware, um, uh, part of the concern of both Labour and the present coalition government has been to preserve what uh, 10 years ago when this was being debated, they talked about the preeminence of the House of Commons. The uh, favoured term now is primacy. Um, and obviously once you've got an elected second chamber that becomes uh, a little bit different because at the moment with a, uh, a, a, an entirely appointed house um, the members recognise when it comes to the crunch that uh, decisions of the Commons have a, a democratic mandate which the house doesn't have. Um, now another thing that the Royal Commission did was to have a look at other chambers, second chambers around the world, to see if there were any lessons to be learnt. Uh, one interesting thing was that 
Uh, on the whole, the answer was not many. Um, the, the biggest single factor that second chambers had in common was that they were what the report called contested institutions. In other words, their nature, their future were a bit controversial. And there are a number of uh, countries that have abolished their second chambers in the past. I've been embarrassed occasionally to sit in conferences in what described as the former second chamber, both in um, Budapest, Hungary abolished theirs, Sweden abolished theirs. Uh, New Zealand theirs, but there's still quite a lot, and most of the big countries of the world have them. And it's quite interesting to see how in some ways the Lords is similar, but in others different from other chambers. I mean, starting close to home, here's the chamber of the House of Commons, and certainly the, the layout, um, the size, are reasonably close. There's, there's sort of a, a lot in common, so we're, we're not out on a limb with what we've got. Now, I thought I'd just do a quick canter around a few other second chambers of the world just to sort of see what's the same and what's different. I don't know if anyone wants to join in and guess which they are. Or tell me which they are today. Any idea which this one is? This is the French Senate, a rather opulent chamber, as you might expect from the French. Now, by world standards, that's a pretty big second chamber, 348 members, but um, that's pretty small compared with our nearly 800. Um, Instead, the number of members of the Assemblée Nationale in France is 577, so substantially more. Same is true of this next one, possibly even more opulent. That's the Italian Senate. They have 321 members um, against 630 in the lower house. Next one, very similar indeed, the Rajya Sabha. That's the upper house of the Indian parliament. 245 members as against 545 in the lower house. And you'll notice all three of those have a, a hemicycle arrangement. Um, it's interesting in India because quite a lot of Commonwealth countries have the site sort of facing each other layout that we um, are used to at Westminster, um, which is sort of sometimes regarded as the, the, the model uh, of uh, certainly all, all, all other parliaments in the former British Empire and um, you'll doubtless have heard the expression of England being the mother of parliaments. It's the, the design of this committee room which is in common with most other select committee rooms is quite an interesting sort of mixture of the two. We have the, the horseshoe table so you've got the facing each other but also an element of the semi hemicycle and indeed for um, investigative type committees which you may well see um, uh, video coverage of their interrogation of witnesses. On the whole, we don't have the adversarial facing each other layout. Now, here's a rather smaller second chamber. Anyone like to guess which this one is? Give you a clue. Big country. Another clue. It's got exactly 100 members. So it's the sort of team photo for the US Senate a few years ago. Uh, they've got a reason for having 100 members. They've got a federal structure with 50 states, and unlike uh, the House of Representatives, where they have three, uh, hang on, I've got this written down, uh, 432 members, um, uh, they have equal representation from all the states, whether it be um, sort of Delaware with a small population or California with 20 million plus. So um, uh, they've got a sort of reason to have a particular type of chamber, but it is quite interesting that they get away with only 100. This one's got labels. You see, it's even, if you can see the writing, which you probably can't most of, it's even got a black rod marched over, marked over on the left. Uh, that's the Australian Senate. Uh, elected, but by different means from their House of Representatives, 76 members against 150 in the lower house. Um, finally, in my little sort of world tour, that's the Canadian Senate. Now, I've put that last because my colleagues in the Canadian Senate think that we are the sort of two most similar uh, upper houses in, in the world. Uh, we're both appointed. They used to be appointed for life. They now have to retire at 75. Um, but an important difference, they've only got just over 100 members. Um, and as you could see, there's room for each of them to have an individual seat, which incidentally is true of most parliaments, including, I think, the European Parliament, even though they've got 700 or whatever, but a huge hemicycle. We certainly haven't got room for that. But their House of Commons has 300 members. So, again, much smaller than the lower house, which is, therefore, a bit of a contrast with the House of Lords, where these days the benches are rather crowded. Um, we've had about 120 new members appointed since the election in 2010. And indeed, um, some seats below bar at the top of this picture, which until uh, 2010 were uh, seats for visitors, uh, had to be allocated to members during question time. In that photo, they're not quite full, but they often are. So we, we do have a, a seriously large chamber. 
Now, I suppose one reason why we're as we are is, is historical, and it's quite interesting how striking the similarities are if you go back in time. These two pictures show on the left uh, Queen Anne in Parliament, in other words, the beginning of the 18th century. I'm afraid it's much easier to get pictures of the opening of Parliament with everybody in their robes than of sort of normal sittings. Um, but um, uh, you get the idea that the layout is similar. This is a, a different room in the old palace that was burnt down in 1834. Um, this one's from the early 19th century. I think it claims to be a debate in the House of Lords, but I don't think the artists could have been there because they've all got robes on, which they certainly wouldn't have worn except for the state opening. Slightly bigger room because in 1801, um, Ireland became part of the United Kingdom and they acquired 28 extra members from the Irish House of Lords, so they moved to a different room. But um, as you can see, it's, it's all pretty similar. And, um, uh, here is the, 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 the last state opening from 2010. We get rather fed up here when the press love using pictures like this to illustrate Parliament, because you only get that once a year, and we haven't had it for two, two years. Uh, but that will be the next sitting, incidentally. Uh, 9th of May, next Wednesday, um, next state opening. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky, I get a sort of reserved seat about there, so the, the uh, members who arrive early get an, uh, a good seat there, but I, I get one reserved. Um, and the Commons, of course, stand at the bar with the Speaker here, uh, and uh, uh, the Prime Minister here, just behind uh, and its members. But that, that is um, uh, not the um, typical scene. This one, rather, uh, is one that always amuses me, just again to show you how far it go goes back. This is Henry VIII in Parliament, a herald's drawing, and uh, the bit in the middle I've enlarged on the right to show we get slightly better treatment as clerks these days. They're kneeling on the floor there with their quill pens. Well, at least I have a, uh, a seat and indeed a laptop at the table to work from. And um, talking of uh, laptops, uh, here's a, a, a thing from the Daily Telegraph about a year ago which amused me. The article is called uh, Apple iPad Enters the House of Lords. And, uh, Indeed, there's been stuff in the media recently about the extent to which iPads are entering. But they've slightly messed up with their choice of photo. Uh, anyone know what that photo shows? It's not a normal sitting of the house. Because um, you can see all some furniture down at the, in the foreground. Um, what this actually is, it was taken in September 2009 and was one of the final judicial sittings of the House of Lords. So there's another bit of history that you should be aware of. For most of my time working in the House of Lords, one of its roles was the final Court of Appeal of the United Kingdom, um, which therefore I, I used to be able to mention in talks as a quite a significant role. But um, here is the actual final judgment. So they took a photo of it because it was a slightly historic occasion at the end of September before they all went off to the Supreme Court. Um, so, uh, to that extent, we've lost a few members, um, but um, uh, it hasn't made a, a significant difference, obviously, because of all the others appointed. So, going back to the House and a little bit about how things operate. Now, um, you'll find sort of maps of the, the, the layout in, in the handouts that you can have, but um, uh, like the Commons, the government are on one side uh, at the bottom of this picture, the opposition on the other. Um, a difference is we have a corner for the bishops over to the left of the government side. And of course the Lord Speaker is not uh, in a chair but on, on a wool sack. There's quite a bit of a practical issue for, for people like me. In the Commons the clerks are just in front of the Speaker and can turn round and give him advice. Uh, here as you can see we're rather a long way so it tends to be um, loud stage whispers from me or passing notes or whatever. Um, since 2010 of course we've had a coalition government. And that picture shows the leader and the deputy leader. I don't know whether they've deliberately worn those colours of ties because it gives you a bit of help in sorting out who's who. Lord Strathclyde is the Conservative leader of the House. Lord McNally, who's also Minister of State and the Ministry of Justice, is the deputy leader and leader of the Liberal Democrats. Um, and the... Um, I should have shown you this in the previous slide. Uh, the, uh, sorry, it doesn't show, but the Liberal Democrats sit over on the right of the government. In fact, when we... Uh, they first went into coalition, but in, in opposition, the Liberal Democrats sat uh, near the throne end on the opposition side. They moved across, but then found they didn't have enough space because the front two spaces were needed for the bishops, so they moved to, after a few months to the, 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 the far end. Um, a significant difference from both the House of Commons and probably pretty well in, in much any other parliament is we have a significant number of what we call cross-benchers, independent members. 
I don't know if anyone can recognise any of those. Here's Michael Martin, now Lord Martin of Springburn, former Speaker of the House of Commons, who in accordance with tradition has abandoned his party allegiance. Uh, next to him is Baroness Heyman, who was a Labour minister in the uh, early years of the Blair government, but in 2006 became the first elected Lord Speaker for a five-year period, and now she stepped down. She's on the cross benches. Um, next to her is Lord Carswell, who's a retired law lord, so we are, uh, only get sort of legal expertise from those who've now retired. And finally, at this end, um, is Lord Laming, who recently became convener of the cross benches. They're a sufficiently organised group with nearly 200 of them um, that they, they have a, a convener. And uh, there's only obviously room for about 15 of them on the actual cross benches, so they also occupy. Uh, a large area over here, with the exception of the front bench, which tends to be for former senior ministers from the Labour Party. So here on the right, for example, is John Reid now, Lord Reid of Cardowan, the former Home Secretary. Um, if, you, if those of you who are near might recognise Lord Banside, formerly Ian Paisley, and his wife in the back visible row there. Uh, 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 a number of Ulster politicians sit on the cross benches rather than join the other mainstream parties, though Lord Trimble is an exception who's joined the Conservatives. Another significant difference um, uh, from, from almost anywhere else is we do have uh, an Episcopal presence. 26 archbishops and bishops are members of the House of Lords. Um, by a happy coincidence, the day our photographer was in, the Archbishop of Canterbury, no less, was there. Um, he's not that regular attender, but both he and the Archbishop of York do come um, quite often. And uh, a bishop always reads prayers, and on any significant debate where you might expect a church view, um, the, the, you'll, you'll get one. So that's sort of quite a, a, a striking special feature of the House, which is one of the things being debated in the context of reform. Now, I mentioned the Lord Speaker, that's Baroness de Souza, who had previously been convener of the cross benches until last summer. Um, and was elected as Lord Speaker. But an important difference from the House of Commons and almost anywhere else is that in the chamber, her role is pretty limited. She will put the question at the end of a debate, but she doesn't call people to speak. On the whole, the House hears who it wants to hear. And if people are fighting to speak, then the leader of the House is the person who helps to sort out the, the, the decision who to hear next. Um, it may sound chaotic at question time, it perhaps is, but most of the time, uh, if there's a set piece debate, there will be a, an informal list of speakers so everybody knows who's coming next. She's the second Lord Speaker. I mentioned Baroness Heyman, who was elected in um, 2006. Before that, we had the um, Lord Chancellor on the Woolsack, which was a slightly curious constitutional arrangement. Anyone remember who the last Lord Chancellor to preside over the House of Lords was? There he is, Lord Falconer of Thoroton. And in those days, you'll see he wore a full-bottomed wig. I still have to wear a short wig, as you've seen, but we decided, or the relevant committee decided when the Speaker was elected, that uh, um, a, a wig was not right in, in this day and age. Anyone remember who followed Lord Faulkner as Lord Chancellor? Just thought you might be amused to be reminded. The first Lord Chancellor in modern times to sit in the House of Commons, Jack Straw. Um, he was willing to wear the gown but not the wig, looking at this picture, whereas the present Lord Chancellor, Kenneth Clark, um, has gone back to the wig. But sadly, he doesn't get the opportunity to wear it in the House of Lords, except um, at the beginning of a new Parliament, when the Lord Chancellor sits in, uh, uh, sort of just in front of where the Queen would sit for the state opening for the, 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 the initiating proceedings. Um, now, we've been concentrating on what goes on in the Chamber, but uh, that's perhaps misleading, so it's worth just having a couple of slides just to remind you that quite a lot goes on below, uh, but behind the scenes, if you like, and in committee rooms. And indeed, nowadays, uh, pretty much any meeting of a committee which is public will also be available, uh, uh, at any rate, with a sound feed or, um, in, in some cases, with a, a webcam. Um, www.parliamentslive, all one word, dot TV is the place to go to, and you can not only get them live but also retrospectively. Uh, this one actually is one of our more modern committee rooms, so it is in the palace, um, and um, it's a bit hard to see. It shows the uh, information committee at work. Uh, that's one of our domestic committees, which would normally look at things like library facilities, IT, uh, the website. Um, and here they were looking at how Parliament engages with the public, which is something they're increasingly interested in. And I guess the fact that I'm here today is, a, is an example of how we try and do what we can to make sure people outside who wish to be informed can be. Uh, next one is our um, Communications Committee. 
Um, again, if you were close by, you could probably recognise, I think there's John Humphreys and Nick Robinson and I think Adam Bolton being quizzed. So, um, uh, one of the more traditional rooms overlooking the river, but the, the, there's perhaps an area where the, the similarity between the two houses is very strong and the sort of things you often see film of, um, typically in this room or a similar one, are um, uh, similar in the Lords as in the Commons. So I think we'd like to think that in the Lords uh, the inter in interrogation is less um, John Humphreys-like, shall we say. You more often get um, witnesses being... Um, uh, uh, interrogated in, in, in the Commons Committees than, than, than the Lords. It's mostly fairly civilised. Now, um, coming back to looking at reform. Um, I mentioned it started in the mid-90s with the Labour Party, and this is the sort of key thing that they put in their manifesto. Um, as an initial self-contained reform, the right of hereditary peers to sit and vote in the House of Lords would be ended by statute. That was quite a clever move making such a specific statement because uh, by then there was a well understood doctrine known as the Salisbury Doctrine that the House of Lords will not throw out a bill for which the government has a mandate, a uh, democratic mandate if you like. So by putting a clear statement in their manifesto and then being elected with a substantial majority um, they were um, ready to go. Um, and um, uh, for phase two, this was, this was phase one, for phase two they initially said they were going to appoint a, a committee, they subsequently, as I mentioned earlier, decided to have a uh, royal commission. Uh, but meanwhile things carried on and during his ten years as Prime Minister, Tony Blair nominated no fewer than 386 new uh, uh, peers to sit in the House of Lords um, and that compares with uh, almost exactly the same number in the 18 years of the Conservatives. So there was quite a sort of, uh, I suppose you could say with the departure of 650 hereditary peers there was some topping up to be done. Gordon Brown by contrast was rather sparing and only nominated 36 but in the uh, uh, just under two years since David Cameron took over um, we've had 120, um, most of them in the first year in fact. Now during that time um, as my earlier slide with a list of inquiries showed, um, consideration has been given, but not much has happened um, on um, uh, the, um, what, what the House of Lords should look like in, in, in future. And indeed, it was in 2007 that uh, there were votes in both houses when the House of Commons supported 100% uh, elected second chamber and also an 80% elected second chamber. Um, now, the nature of these elections is something that some thought has been given to. Anyone know who this gentleman is? Billy Bragg is the name. I think he's best known as a singer-songwriter, but he also has some interesting ideas about House of Lords reform. I think they've rather lost favour now, but I just mentioned this as an example of how there are different ways of doing it. His scheme was for what he called a secondary mandate. And it didn't mean go, people going out to vote separately at all. Basically, you take all the votes to cast in a general election for the House of Commons, aggregate constituencies into regional groups, and appoint people off party lists by reference to the um, number of votes cast for that party. So you'd introduce an element of more proportional representation. Small parties like the Green Party that might not get many seats might nevertheless by this aggregation get a, a reasonable representation in the upper house. I think one reason it didn't find favour was perhaps the, the corollary of what I've just said that um, that might mean that uh, people are encouraged to vote for parties which won't win in the local constituency in the hope of getting them into the second chamber and therefore might distort the elections um, and for whatever reason um, he hasn't done as well as he might in persuading people. Now relative to 2010, an interesting thing about the present setup is although the proposals for reform are extremely controversial, actually all three parties um, uh, uh, put stuff in their manifesto at the last election proposing reform. So here's the Labour one. Uh, we need fundamental reform of our politics and uh, we will let the British people decide on whether to make Parliament more democratic and accountable in referenda on reform of the House of Commons and House of Lords. So they, they were interested in House of Lords reform too. Um, further reform, democratic reform to create a fully elected second chamber will be achieved in stages. 
Um, the Liberal Democrats, uh, they've for a long time been um, very keen on a democratic second chamber, and they, they're pretty clear, replace the House of Lords with a fully elected second chamber with considerably fewer members than the current House. And finally, the Conservative one with the um, charming um, uh, manifesto title, Invitation to Join the Government of Britain. We will seek to build a consensus for a mainly elected second chamber. Well, now, of course, what we've actually got is a coalition, and what they came up with was a House of Lords reform draft bill that was published in May last year. Um, and that was then referred to a joint committee, and their report was published only a week or two ago uh, on the uh, 23rd of April. Um, and uh, got quite a, a splash. Um, broadly, this offers 80 or 100 percent, 300 member house. These, the committee prefers 450, um, which is still a substantial reduction. Uh, quite a lot of votes. If you look at the uh, uh, record of discussions at the back of the um, uh, report, there were a lot of divisions. So they weren't unanimous by any means. So perhaps the, the clearest single message is that this is controversial. And indeed, um, when it was agreed that there would be a debate on, in the House of Lords on the subject before the end of the session, they arranged to hold one uh, last Monday. They then had to spill over into Tuesday because there were um, 70 or more members wishing to speak. Um, that report, incidentally, was um, from a committee chaired by Lord Richard, a former Labour leader of the House from the early days of the Blair government, uh, who, who, who's there. And he's an enthusiast for reform. Incidentally, does anyone recognise anyone else in that picture? <laughs> If anyone thought that Alan Sugar was too busy hiring and firing apprentices to come to work, take part in the House of Lords, this is Lord Sugar immediately behind Lord Richard. Um, now, that's, that's where we are, and uh, where we go from here is anybody's guess. Um, the uh, Queen's speech will tell us whether there will be an actual bill as opposed to a draft bill to reform the House of Lords uh, in the next session. Um, People on the whole expect that there will be, though there was stuff in the media a day or two ago suggesting it might be something less than a full bill because all they promised to do is put proposals forward. Um, it will undoubtedly start in the House of Commons, um, and I'll just explain a, a sort of practical reason why in a moment, but uh, uh, media coverage of discussions in backbench conservative meetings the other week suggested it will be pretty controversial there. A possible reason for that is that um, the question of primacy is much harder to maintain if you've got two democratically elected chambers. And I think uh, when I was young, we used to think MPs wouldn't want a fully elected second chamber because their lives would become more difficult. It would be, if, if you'd ever disagreed with them, it would be fighting that much harder. And we've had one or two bills in the last rather long session uh, the Welfare Reform Bill was one example where a number of Lords' amendments, which would have cost money, were rejected by the Commons, giving what's known in the trade as a privilege reason. Um, uh, raising and spending public money has for centuries been regarded as the prerogative of the House of Commons, it, as the elected House, and the Lords can offer a view, but uh, they have to yield to the Commons. So uh, any th amendment that would cost money, the Commons can plead privilege and reject it. And that was quite controversial as it was, but if you imagine a, an elected second chamber being told to pipe down on that account, um, they might well say, well, we're entitled to our view, you've got the Parliament Act provisions, which according to this bill will continue, that's to say that if a bill is reintroduced in the same form in the following session in the House of Commons, it can become law without the consent of the upper house. If you've got that, then you can use it. So you could have a much more combative sort of politics. And I think there is a worry that, uh, uh, as the saying goes, be careful what you wish for, that that may be the outcome. So if you follow these things, there's a very interesting debate to be had. The uh, practical reason why uh, this bill is bound to start in the Commons is that if you don't start it in the Commons, there's no way you've got the provisions of the Parliament Acts to force it through. And um, uh, the House of Lords, having decisively rejected in votes um, uh, on several occasions the idea of a mainly elected second chamber, um, plainly it would be doomed if it began in the House of Lords. Um, we can perhaps talk more about that quest over questions if you want to. I thought I'd end with just a few slides to illustrate that the, 
that the House of Lords may be rooted in history, but, but I have done a few things to modernise. You can't see it very well, but I chose this slide because on the left you could see one of the uh, television cameras. Uh, we were actually first to be broadcast on television in 1985. And the Commons didn't follow until 1989. That was quite a good period for us because I think the uh, TV companies were keen to show they were responsible broadcasters, so they gave us quite a lot of coverage in those four years as, as a way of um, persuading the Commons they were fit to be uh, allowed into the Commons as well. And as I've said, it, it, it eventually happened four years later. Now here, I don't know if anyone could see what's different about this picture from um, the others I've shown you. This was, to, yep. That actually, that you're right, but that actually is, is relatively recent innovation, but we now have it all the time. For uh, the, These screens, you can, you can see them in this room, either side at each end, uh, tell people what's going on. And we've always had them in the galleries. And incidentally, the one thing I haven't mentioned, but I'm sure you're all aware, uh, you can typically tell which part of the building you're in by the colour scheme. So any, anything in the columns is green, so the green screen there tells you what's going on in the Commons and the deep red screen there tells you what's going in the Lords. Um, then the members decided three or four years ago it would be useful for them to know what was going on as well. It sort of helps you to see who's speaking if you don't know. So we've got those. But no, it's, it's the nature of the people here. They're a rather different crew from usual. This is actually the finals of the International De Schools Debating Competition of the English Speaking Union in May 2007. A Saturday afternoon, the first time people other than members had been allowed to sit on the red benches. I picked this picture because actually that's me with my wife and daughter sitting in the uh, officials box watching. Uh, quite a sort of big new uh, innovation to be at. And we did it again a year later. This is the uh, uh, UK Youth Parliament meeting in the House of Lords Chamber in 2008. We, we actually stole a march on the Commons there. I think when Gordon Brown came to power in the context of his governance of Britain agenda, he announced a proposal that the UK Youth Parliament should meet in the House of Commons chamber. And they did a year or two later, but they uh, met in ours first. So we stole the mark. Now, whether that's a model of a future reform second chamber, uh, your guess is at least as good as mine. But I thought that was a good note to end on. So I'll stop there and um, open it up to questions. <laughs>